Hello and welcome everyone to come out to my talk. My name is Forrest Gibson. First off, I wanted to thank Oculus for putting on this event. For those of you who were here yet last year, it was an enormously powerful experience. Whether it was Carmack's keynote talk, where he came out on stage, said he didn't prepare a single slide, and then continued to enthrall us for his entire talk. Or it was all the demos that were lining the hallways, where people were pulling out laptops and DK1s and DK2s and showing these things off and showing the things that they worked on. Getting a chance to meet with people who cared about as VR as much as I did. These were amazing experiences. <laughs> also, the after party, where uh, for those of you who were there, uh, Palmer, it was his birthday party, so he got a cake. It was actually like a, an Oculus cake. And then he also proceeded to jump into the pool with all of his clothes on. It was epic. But you kind of just had to be there to experience it. But luckily, you're here today. And I believe this year is going to be just as amazing, if not better. But isn't this all a bit strange? I mean, we live in this hyper-connected world. Here's a visualization of what the internet today looks like. We are at a stage where it's actually harder to get away from communication than it is to have it. Teleconferencing technology has been the best it's ever been, allowing us to see crisp video and audio from other people anywhere around the world. And we're carrying these little magical devices on us that allow us to connect with anyone, anywhere, anytime through text, video, calling, and any one of us in this room has the power to reach out to anyone else in this room at any time, regardless of where you are. Isn't that amazing? Like, we live in this futuristic world. But that leads me to the question, why are you here? Seriously, why are you here today? We live in this amazingly connected world, yet you decided to come here. For many of us, we traveled from areas further away. I mean, I came from Seattle, but I'm sure many people have flown in from much, much further, from around the world, dealing with the hassle of travel, going through security, getting on flights, getting crammed into a seat, not to mention all the money, the time, the hassle, all of these things going to this thing, and yet you're here today. Honestly, you could have stayed at home and waited to watch coverage of this event. You could wait and uh, skim through this talk later to just get to the meaty parts and just save some time. I mean, honestly, you could be at home. You didn't have to wear pants. How cool is that? But we all know that nothing matches what we have here today. The photos I showed you earlier were tiny little snapshots into a world, unless you were here, you didn't experience. Even watching a video of this talk later you might be able to get the information from this talk, but you don't get the interactions with the people sitting next to you. You don't get those chance encounters where you find out that someone has a shared interest, obviously VR here, and you miss out on those bumping into people in the hallway. So what if on the horizon there was some technology that would allow us to feel like we could teleport to other locations around this world or any others. Some way that we could feel like we were present with other people, like we do today in this audience. Okay, obviously, I'm talking about virtual reality. I mean, that's no surprise here. We're at Oculus Connect, and we're here to talk about virtual reality. And I'm sure I'm not alone in the belief that VR will make the world a much smaller place, allowing us to communicate with people as if we were in person, no matter where they are, not currently possible today. So we aren't there yet, obviously. You're still here, and there's a lot of magic about this conference that technology hasn't allowed us to overcome. And that's even though this conference is about virtual reality. In-person conversations and interactions are still the way that we live in this world whether it's coming to a conference like this, or it's going to a business meeting across the world, or going to see a live show. Schools, university, office places, these are just 
buildings. These are things we make. These are technology that we've developed to make it easier for us to communicate and collaborate. So you're still here, and I'm up here. So why am I here? Well, I have a passion for understanding how we communicate with each other in very natural, conversational ways. And not long ago, not long after the Oculus Kickstarter, I got a chance to try VR for the first time since the 90s. <clears throat> and I saw the potential for what this could mean for connecting people together, and I wanted to get involved. I took the red pill as fast as I could. I wanted to create experiences where people could interact with each other in VR, and I wanted to do it now. So I partnered with my friend Jared Cheshire to embark on an endeavor. And instead of using what was currently available in terms of technology, we decided to use technology that was closer to um, commercial grade and what we believed would more closely resemble the types of technology that would be available in the near future. Namely, highly accurate one-to-one -one motion tracking, which can be used for positional tracking or for skeleton tracking. Now keep in mind that we were doing this in the time when this was all DK1. This was before we actually had the ability to have positional tracking you know, provided by Oculus. And what came out of that was a thing called Giant versus Horde, which was this kind of hybrid gaming and entertainment event where a person who is fully embodied in a motion capture suit and a VR headset was controlling a giant, fighting against a horde of people in tiny little spaceships as they flew around them trying to shoot down this giant. It was basically the most epic boss battle you've ever seen, and there was a real person behind it. Because we wanted to create something that would allow people to interact with someone who is embodied in VR and experiencing this for themselves. And in doing so, we learned a lot. We found that even if you have really great input, the slide you saw earlier, we had um, 49 points of tracking. That's a lot of really accurate optical tracking. But we learned some things. The first one is that your avatar needs to be the proper proportions, that even though you have all of this tracking, your avatar needs to be scaled to you. Because as you move around, you can feel your body. It's a term uh, called proprioception, where you understand where your body exhibits in, um, exists in space. And what we found was that if it wasn't properly scaled to your body, if my arms are too long or my arms are too short, I could put my hands together and they wouldn't actually be together. There'd be some offset. Maybe they'd go through, them, through themselves or they wouldn't touch. We learned how important positional audio and chat was for these experiences. Because even if you could see someone and, and feel like they're there with you, you obviously needed to hear them. And you needed to hear them where they're supposed to be in space. We learned the challenges of networking and networking physics, which is not easy to do, especially when you're trying to recreate something that makes people feel like they're there. Any sort of jitter or lag or anything you encounter there breaks people out of this experience, especially if it's related to the people. And we got a chance to experiment a bit with gesture controls, that once we have our full body, we could control things. Actually, one of the things the giant could do is if you put your hand out like this, you could shoot laser beams out of your arm. It's pretty cool. So we took these learnings and technologies and applied them to other things. So we had an event at the Living Computer Museum, which is up in Seattle, Washington, where we had a chance to demo some of this technology to a wider group of people and, and in a different way than we had originally intended. We've been spending so much time on using these multi-user multi VR experiences that we wanted to bring people together, not just playing through a computer screen flying a spaceship, but all the way to being in the same place with them. So the experience that we demoed was we had some actor friends of ours help us out. And they acted as hosts in this kind of virtual play where four people who were in DK2s were sharing the same virtual environment with this actor as they were playing through various scenes, demonstrating the power of virtual reality and what it could mean for bringing people together and communicating. So each of the members actually had the ability to hear the person and interact with them. And we had this kind of funny thing where uh, when they would sit down, we would get their information from them. So we get their name and we get their um, something funny about them. And the actor was able to play off of that 
and tease them or joke about their, where they work or ask them questions in ways that you know, no one had ever interacted with a virtual character like this before. When was the last time you played a video game and the character turned to you and started talking to you and referencing things about your life? It's kind of weird, but it was powerful. Here we also really encountered the issues of audio latency and how important it is for creating these kinds of experiences, especially since we were in the same room as the actors. So they're all in the same physical space. So we had to deal with latency and get it down so low that the person in the real room talking, the virtual sound wouldn't be so slow as to make a disconnect between those two things. So after all these learnings and all of these experiences, it became obvious to us that we wanted to focus on connecting people together through virtual reality technology. And that's where Pluto VR was born. We had a chance to connect with John Vici, one of the founders of PopCap, and Jonathan Geibel, who was one of the technical directors from Disney Animation who worked on films such as Frozen and Big Hero 6. And we all shared the same passion, not only for the culture of the company we wanted to build together, but also for the belief that this technology could change the world. Our vision at Pluto VR is to transcend physical location. We want to make it possible for humans to connect, collaborate, and interact with each other as if they are in person. So since this is all we've been living and breathing for years now, and since we've been so focused on this and the idea of shared presence, we were asked to come talk here today about what we've learned and some of the stories that we have to tell. Let's start with what we have in this room today. Obviously, you're all present. You walked into this room. You're here. You feel like you're here. You probably don't feel like you're somewhere else. Whether or not you're fully paying attention and engaged is different, but you feel like you're here. I don't think there's any question about that. Anyone who's watching this video later probably feels like they're at their computer or on their iPad or something. And this is presence that we have in real life. It's a feeling of being somewhere. You have it right now. And you pretty much always have it. And it can't be easily conveyed or explained. Oculus has been doing a great job in defining the technical requirements for achieving presence in VR. They talk about the latency. They talk about the tracking. They talk about the optics that are required. So if presence is a feeling of being somewhere, then that means shared presence is a feeling of being inhabiting the same place as someone else, being there with them. Again, we all have this right now. Look around the room. Look around the room. Just look at people. You see that there are people around you. You know that there are people around you. Even if you can't see them, you actually probably know there's people behind you from the subtle cues of their, their voices or their coughs or things like that. I know this sounds like a no-brainer. <laughs> I know that, yes, we all know that people are in this room and we, we live in this place with people. But I want to emphasize these points because they're important for distinguishing and determining how we move forward for developing shared presence for the purpose of VR. Turns out that we are so good at detecting the presence of other human beings that we do it so much we do it wrong sometimes. And that's the feeling of people seeing if they, they felt like there's ghosts around them or something. That's how good we are at detecting when other people are around us. And as we build and develop towards virtual reality, there is this, th this threshold. That it's not just voice chat, and it's not just playing a multiplayer video game. We've all played you know, online games, FPSs, things like that, and we didn't feel like the people were there. Yes, we thought, yeah, we're playing the same game as them. But we didn't have the same experiences that we have that we do in this audience. So we are present with each other. We share this presence. I want to talk a bit about how we share presence with other humans, the modes of communication. There are three modes of communication, how we interact with each other in this, this world. There's interpretive. This is what you're doing right now. You're sitting in this audience, and you're listening to me. Some people are doing several things. They can also be reading their computer. That's interpretive. You're listening, and you're paying attention. There's interpersonal. So if I say, hi, how are you doing? Good. Oh, that's good. I'm doing pretty well. I'm, I'm speaking right now, so I'll talk to you later. So that's interpersonal. That's when you connect with other people directly. It's conversational. It's natural. 
I didn't have to press any buttons to do what I just did. I looked at someone and I talked to them. And then they talked back. And that's interpersonal. And presentational is obviously what I'm doing now, as I'm presenting information to all of you. I'm broadcasting this information out to others. So clearly there are a lot of things going on here. Reality is very complex, and it's very challenging to try to recreate. But we're not trying to create reality. What we're trying to create is shared presence. So where do we start? We have to understand that as we're building towards this, we have to start somewhere. If we throw everything into a pot at the same time, it'll be very difficult to scientifically test what's working and what's not working. You can't bug fix unless you understand and are able to isolate each one of those bugs. And when you're dealing with the nuance of human communication and connection, it's very hard to immediately understand what's wrong. You might do some user testing, and people will say, I don't know, it feels off. And that's about as much as you might get. So let's start with nothing. Let's clean the slate and think about the technology that we have and the ways we could apply it to creating the first kind of proto-shared presence. Imagine that you're in a perfectly dark room. You're wearing all black. And if there are any other people in this room, they're also wearing all black, head to toe. You can't see them. Positional audio is to the point where, with optimizing latency, it's possible to feel like you're talking to someone and feel like they're present in this virtual dark room around you. Now imagine that the same perfectly dark room, you put on white, you put on illuminated masks. And now you're able to see people move because the Oculus and HMDs give us amazing head tracking for the purpose of presence, because they need that to feel present. Now you're in this perfectly dark room, and you see these masks moving around, and you can hear people talking from those masks. And while this is a very bizarre scenario that I kind of hope most of you don't experience on a day-to-day on a -day basis, we can actually do a pretty good job of simulating that today in virtual reality. So where do we go then from there? We want to be building the foundation. We want to be building off of that clean slate, building off of what we have and what we know, and being careful not to introduce noise or incorrect information into this situation that breaks this presence. Because if you start with the bare minimum and have a sense of presence and slowly build up, if at any point in time you make a decision that breaks that experience, that people are no longer expressing that they have this visceral feeling that they're in the same place as others, then you know to just roll it back and try something else. I want to speak a bit about audio. So I already mentioned the fact that low latency audio voice chat is incredibly important. I'm going to keep referencing this room because this is what we're sharing right now. The latency in this room is very low. Sound travels very quickly, and you don't notice any sort of perceptible lag in communication. And the thing about a delay in communication is that it actually is part of communication. If someone were to tell me something and I were to pause, and if I were to pause long enough especially, that would mean something. They would read into that statement. They would gather information for my actions. But if we are introducing artificial latency, if we're introducing artificial lag into these situations, then we're going to be throwing noise into what it means to be with other people, to be communicating with them. We want to be driving towards the highest quality, the highest fidelity audio that we can get, given the technology that we have available. Also, who we're building for. If you know your audience isn't going to have high fidelity mics or isn't going to have the best internet connection, you might want to think about designing an experience where people in your experience are actually talking to each other through radios. Maybe they're in spacesuits, and the idea that their voices are somewhat garbled or not the highest quality, it makes sense within the context, because you're remaining true to the world that you're building. Positional audio is essential to have shared presence with other people in a place that you feel like you're actually in the same room, beyond the bizarre spacesuit kind of situation. 
For those of you who haven't heard of it, there's a thing called the cocktail party effect, where our brains are so good at deciphering the information around us that we can be in a very loud, crowded room, and yet we can isolate the voice of someone talking to us. A big way that we do this is by using the positional audio to isolate where that person is in 3D space and essentially ignore all the other information that's coming to us from outside of that area. And that if you've ever played a multiplayer game where there's just one layer of voice chat, you know that there's no way to decipher that information and split it apart. It's one big garbled stream of information. And all of this needs to be coupled with head tracking because that's where your ears are. That's, your ears are attached to your head. It should also involve a good, H, um, a good head model for your binaural audio, for your positional audio, which is something that a lot of people are working on. So let's take a look at this dot. Pretty cool dot. You see it? Yeah, you see a dot. I don't know how many of you know what that is. Well, let's try adding something. Let's take a look at these dots. Do you see anything in those dots? Do you perceive anything happening there? Or are they just dots? Well, if you haven't seen it, now you can see something else. And here, I think it's pretty obvious what this is. And I think everyone in this room can identify what this is. This is a person walking kind of at an angle towards the camera. But we all know it's a person, right? Does anyone here not see a person out of this? So if we all see that this is a human being, and we all associate that in our brain, that this is a human being, like, are we crazy? These are just a bunch of white dots. There's no human here. We don't see any human. So when I talked about the fact that we're not creating reality, we're not trying to recreate reality, what we're trying to do is trick our brains into believing that what we're seeing in this virtual space is actually th that person is there with us. Let's add something onto it. We can easily decipher what's going on in this video. There are two people now. Again, just a series of white dots. This is part of uh, research that James Mass did at the Cornell University in 1971 about motion and how we perceive it. We are very good at detecting the movements of others. It doesn't take much for our brains to fill in the gaps and to imagine a person there. There's a story that I heard. Um, it's actually from Reddit, but um, it's an interesting story. And this, I, this, the idea was that this um, father had been playing this racing game, and he got into VR really early. So he was in this racing game, and his son decided to spectate also in VR. And what he expressed was very interesting about this experience is he was watching his father racing this car. The thing was that his father had no avatar. There was no representation of what his father was doing in VR besides his movement of the steering wheel because he had an actual hardware steering wheel controller that was being tracked. But the son was able to see the movement the natural movement, the way that his father would hold the steering wheel and associate it with him. And he was able to build the image of his father in its entirety in this car. He even, he even imagined what it was like to see how his face was moving as he was taking turns and, and doing well or doing poorly. So in each of these scenarios, especially when we're talking about representing the human form with any sort of representation in that sense, it's very important that we set the scale properly. Because if we scale the size of an avatar, but don't appropriately scale the positional and tracking data associated with those sizes, information is lost. If I scaled my head up to be the size of the stage, and then I moved like this, it would be a nearly imperceptible movement. But on the stage, me doing this is very obvious. Because we have that data, and it's being shown to us in the proportions in the way that we're used to and that we're used to. Embrace this. This is exciting. This is not bad news. 
What this means is that through all the limitations around rendering and around hitting, uh, you know, hitting your frame rate and around the lack of tracking that we have for many different platforms, what this tells us is that it's possible for us to convey a sense of a human, a biological movement of another human being in a way that we can see and fill in the gaps. And it doesn't take a fully realistic humanoid avatar to do that. It can only take a few dots. So experiment with this. Learn that you can make avatars in many different ways and represent people in different ways that are appropriate for the experience that you're creating. Because there are lots of different ways to represent this. It doesn't necessarily have to be what we think of as a human. However, it should, track, it should closely track the data you have. It should match that data and make use of it. Don't throw it away. And you need to be wary about adding noise into the situation and showing information that you don't have. And especially if you are adding inferred information based on the track data, that you are being aware to not show body positions that, that break that sense of presence. You need to keep those plausible. Shared agency. So one of the things about sharing a space with others and doing things with others is the fact that we're doing things with others. That's what we do. I don't think most people sit around and go meet up and sit in a room and don't do anything together. Hey, let's go not do anything together. That's not what people say. They talk about going and doing stuff together and thinking about how they're interacting. So these shared activities, I don't know how many people here have had, got, got a chance to try the uh, Oculus Touch toy box demo, but I think this is a great example of what a shared activity looks like and how it can give you a sense of shared presence. Even though the avatars were very simple, essentially kind of holographic heads with hands, that really didn't matter. Because you were like a child, focusing on the blocks and the fireworks and all the toys that were in front of you. And you knew someone was there. But it wasn't as important that you had to look at them and stare at them and determine what their emotions were based on their facial gestures. You just wanted to have fun. And those avatars worked appropriately. This also goes back to having a purpose. Why are you meeting? Why are you connecting with someone in virtual reality? And taking use of that and emphasizing that element. Being able to play and interact with the same objects can help enhance shared presence and maintain it. When we are interacting with the same physical world, that's what we experience in day-to-day -day life. We found early on that one of our most compelling experiences that we had made was ball catch. It was kind of a joke around the office that we're like, man, we're going to be the ball company. We're going to make ball throwing. It's awesome. Just because it was so simple, yet it was so fun. Because we were lacking so much other information about what the entire person's body is doing, but we knew where their hands were, and we could track that. And we could allow them to play catch with each other. So take a look at this picture. Obviously, this picture is two horses um, next to a mountain range in a field and a bird. There's also a bird in the center. And this, it's clearly a couple cottages with a young shepherd boy tending to his flock and a kind of old dead tree. And here, a young woman sitting down, seemingly kind of bored, reading a book in front of a table. We are very good at seeing faces in just about everything. And the thing, about the, things you, the, the thing about those images you just looked at is that they were not realistic. They didn't have a high poly count around facial features, necessarily. They didn't have the kinds of things that we think about when we think about realistic faces. Yet it was very easy to identify them as human faces because they had the proper proportions and alignment. The eyes where the eyes were supposed to be, the ears were where the ears were supposed to be, and so on. And keep in mind that these were inanimate objects. These were not organic, or some of them were organic, but in general, they were mostly inanimate objects. And as we build towards creating human faces in virtual environments, we need to be wary 
about falling into the uncanny valley. The phenomenon where the more realistic something becomes, the more susceptible it is to causing us unnervedness if it doesn't move in exactly the right way. Because we don't have perfect facial tracking that we can just put on an avatar and have it just work. I mean, we're putting an Oculus Rift on our face, which is actually obscuring most of our face, making it even more difficult today to capture what the face is doing than it was pre-Rift. Our hands. These are what we use to interact with the world and show agency. If I say, hey, look over here, I didn't have to say where to look. I didn't say, you know, to my right about this many degrees. I just pointed and you understood where I was indicating. And when you use hands and you enable those things in your experiences, you need to make sure that they are well tracked and you understand what they're doing in space. You should also consider their alignment to where the user's hand is. Because going back to proprioception, if I feel like my hands are in a certain orientation, I feel like my hands are somewhere, if I show very natural human-like hands in a different position, it can pull me out of that experience. It can make me challenge what I'm seeing. And more so, that's on the presence end. It'll also make me challenge what other people are doing. Because if their hands are moving in a bizarre or strange way, that'll break the shared presence for me. Our personal space. So something we've never really had to deal with before in digital communications. So have you ever had, I mean, have you ever been on a video conference call with someone where you had to tell them to back off because they're getting too much in your face? No. If they got too close to their camera, it'd be extremely unflattering for them and their face would be really big on the screen. But you can always set the distance that you have between your screen and yourself. But in virtual reality, we strap the screen to your face. So it's hard to escape. We found that once you've achieved a level of shared presence, having someone come too close to you is a visceral experience. It's something that causes your lizard brain to react in a fight or flight mechanism. It's something that you, you feel in your gut. I have a funny story. So um, we had uh, early on, we were doing um, some experiments, and we had actually uh, planned a surprise birthday party for John um, in VR. We were spread out across the country, and yet we are all inhabiting the same place, wearing party hats, with a giant virtual cake, and we had a surprise party for him. We even sang him happy birthday. But what's interesting about this experience was that one of the people, like this was before we had really, in this specific example, we hadn't been experimenting with locomotion. One person was sitting too close to other people. And even though these were very simplistic avatars, he still had a sense of anxiety from being too close to others. So it got to a point where he decided to take the headset off. And that even though we were celebrating someone's birthday and having a good time, and this is also a work event, so he's technically required, he took it off and decided to just look at the screen and interact with us through audio. And so for him, it made him very uncomfortable. And for us, now there's just a head kind of sitting over here, which became very strange. In the same way, we need to be very aware of the different requirements for presence and not only presence, but also the ability to prevent people from getting motion sickness through locomotion. We need to be aware of where we're putting people in virtual space and where we're putting them relative to others. We either need to be preventing other people from getting inside of their space, or at the very least, allowing those people very easy mechanisms to back away from those scenarios or pull themselves out of the experience. Because in the same way that I am extremely sensitive to motion sickness and cannot do any unnatural locomotion in VR, there are also people out there who are extremely sensitive to social dynamics and social positioning with other people. Our social bubbles change constantly and dynamically. 
And this is going to be really hard to nail in VR, but it's true, and that's what we have. When you're sitting next to someone in a movie theater, as you are here, it might feel perfectly comfortable. Going back to the modes of communication, you are in an interpretive mode, and that means that you're able to kind of be less there and be OK sitting closer to people. But now imagine that the person you're sitting next to, you're now sitting at a coffee shop. And you're on the same side of a table talking to this person on a coffee sh in that coffee shop. You'd probably feel uncomfortable in that context of having that interpersonal conversation and either move away from them or get on the other side of the table. This is what I mean by being, it being dependent on context. Also, the closer you are to someone or the more comfortable you are with them, the different that personal space can get. And these things change based on culture. Some cultures are very comfortable speaking very close to someone, and others require a much further distance between people as they're conversing. And if we believe that virtual reality will be a way that people are able to communicate with others around the world, inhabiting the same place, having a sense of shared presence with them, then we need to be thinking about and designing for that fact and understanding that different people will have different expectations around how close other people should be to them. So once we have a sense of shared presence, a couple of interesting things start happening. So I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but you might be driving along in your car, and you have this feeling that someone is looking at you, and you turn to the car next to you just to find out that they are. We're very good at sensing the eye contact, sensing other people looking at us. We can debate how much sensitivity we actually have and who's better or not. But in general, this is something that we all possess. So early on in our testing, when we were still using those same illuminated masks, actually, floating in space, we had, an, I, I personally had a very interesting experience where I was testing for one of the other co-founders, Jonathan Geibel. And we were chatting for a while. And at this one moment, he turns to me and just starts looking at me. And, you know, hey, Jonathan, what's up? Silence. And I was like, OK, Jonathan, what you, what's, what's going on? What's wrong? And he just keeps sitting there, silently staring at me. And I get really uncomfortable. Like, this guy is like, staring at me, and, and, and something's wrong, and he's not saying. I'm getting to this point where I can feel it in my body that I feel this sense of him staring at me, and that there's something going on. And all of a sudden, he disappears and reappears and says, sorry, I lost connection. And I realized that I had that sense of shared presence with someone else. And that I felt his eyes digging into me, indicating that something was wrong. And the thing is, he didn't even have eyes. These masks were hollow. There were no eyes there. Yet I experienced a deep sense of the human gaze. Later on in some of those same experiments, we were all watching funny cat videos in VR, like you do. And again, Jonathan here was sitting up front while the three of us uh, were sitting behind. And we were all kind of chatting and talking. And afterwards, he expressed the sense of people's eyes on the back of his head, that feeling you have. You might be walking down an alleyway, and you feel like there's someone behind you. And on top of that, he also expressed the fact that he felt kind of left out socially. We had positional audio, so he knew where we were talking from. And for him to watch the screen, he had to look one direction. And to talk to us, he had to turn around to look the other. Eye contact and the human gaze is something powerful that we get out of shared presence. Another thing that we get is empathy. When someone is in a virtual environment with you, you feel present. And you feel a sense of shared presence with them. We begin to feel the same things that we feel in the rest of our lives. If you sense something is wrong, you react to that. If you see them doing something that is disturbing, you react to that. I was giving a demo to one of my friends who was not only experiencing VR for the first time, but was also experiencing shared presence for the first time. And I was walking him through kind of our demo and explaining what we were doing. And he had some sort of technical problem. 
Not so much so that he was out of the experience, but there was just something wrong. So I said, I'm going to come down and help you, because I was upstairs and he was downstairs. And by the time I got to him, he had the headset off, and he had this really weird look on his face. And I said, hey, man, what's, what's going on? And he looks at me and says, I just saw you put your hands together like you were praying, and then flop to the floor. <laughs> and he described that being a very disturbing experience, and he was very concerned for me. Like he was taking the headset off because he wanted to make sure I was okay, because it looked like I just passed out. When really anyone who's been experimenting and using VR knows, I took off the headset and set it down. Understanding that once we have shared presence with someone, that is a precious thing that we need to be careful about how we treat it. That if someone is going to be taking a headset off or doing something that would appear truly unnatural and disturbing, that we are careful about how we handle those things. Which brings me to the fact that we need to fail gracefully. Because this is technology, this is development, and we will fail. Something will go wrong at some point, there will be something that glitches, and the experience will break. I mean, honestly, anyone here who's used a computer that has never crashed? Yeah, I thought so. So we need to be thinking about this as we're designing experiences and making sure that once we have and attained a level of shared presence, we're respecting that and knowing that since things will fail, having backup systems in place to protect against that. If at the time in our early experiment, when I had taken my headset off, my avatar disappeared or changed state to kind of an AFK kind of thing, that might have been more comforting or more understandable. More understandable. If you have bad tracking or your program is detecting that you're losing the actual, you know, you're losing it, either hiding those things or removing them in different ways, you could potentially abstract them making it so that the less information you have about something, the bigger and the more blobby it gets, the less clear it is. Because when we've achieved shared presence, in the same way that the first time that you had a sense of presence while using virtual reality, you felt transported to a new world, shared presence is a sense that you've been transported to a place with other people. And when you nail it, and when you maintain it, and you protect it, you can have experiences that are truly profound. So not long ago, in, well, again, some of our early experiments, um, one of the other co-founders and I were um, having a discussion, a chat with someone who is in Australia, a, par a potential partner that we were looking into. And we sat there talking to him for like 45 minutes. And what we noticed was, that the conversation was flowing naturally. We were able to bounce back and forth between people talking in a very seamless way, a way that I've never had on any conference call ever. Even video conference calls still bump into these problems. But because we got those subtle head gestures, those subtle movements of when someone was about to talk, we were able to respect that. Because we had low enough latency, that we didn't talk over each other and involved in that process. We felt like we were there in the room with each other, and we talked for quite a while. Later on, he described that even though this is someone who lived in Australia and had spent most of his professional career interfacing with international companies via conference calls and video calls, this was by far the most compelling international conversation he had ever had. And when he finally made his way up to Seattle to visit us, and we all met, each one of us had a very strange response. You know, it made us uncomfortable because we looked at him, and, and the first words out of all of our mouths were basically nice to see you again. Because even though the representations of what we saw of him, the what we saw of him, was in no way representative of what he is or you know, what he looks like, we got a, a real presence. We got, we got the sense of who he was and that we had spent 45 minutes chatting with him and getting to know him. 
Even in our early experiments with masks, we found that each one of the co-founders of Pluto could immediately recognize the other simply based on the way their head moved. Because apparently I have a very unique way I move my head. But everyone else does too. And these are the kinds of magic that we can build and build towards in virtual reality. It's a magic that you have in this audience today. It's a feeling of being somewhere and being somewhere with people. And it's something I believe we should all be building towards. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, we uh, can open the floor for questions. If anyone has any questions they'd like to um, ask. Any questions? Come down to the mic, please. Hi. Uh, Andrew from Wondergate. Uh, that's an awesome talk. So we have two questions. The first question is that how do you guys envision local motion is going to be solved in the social VR context? And uh, the second question is that... Uh, well, I can answer the first one, yeah, and sure. then uh, we'll dig into it. So locomotion is one of those things that is very challenging, and I think we all are bumping up against that. And the thing about locomotion is that it's hard enough to deal with it for maintaining personal presence. That if I am moving around a space in a way that, is, that breaks the experience for me, that is bad for myself, it also can be bad for others. Because if you move in some sort of unnatural way, other people will see you doing that, and that's kind of weird. You know, if my, my legs are doing this, but I'm actually moving this direction, there's a lot of disconnect. And while if I could moonwalk, I would and show you, like that kind of unnatural movement is in the realm of entertainment because it's weird and takes us out of the scenario. So in terms of that, I mean, there aren't clear answers. You know, we're looking at, at ways to try to minimize the amount people need to move around. Because when I was on this stage talking to you, besides a little bit of moving back and forth, I didn't need to move much. And the same way that most of you sitting in this audience for the purpose of this, this presentation, you didn't have to walk or move around at all. So for us, in terms of social contexts, it's more about getting to where you need to be and being there. So if you teleport, doing that in a comfortable way that's both comfortable for you and the other people. So not an immediate pop potentially, but maybe a subtle transition or a subtle fade with enough cues to let you know, oh, someone's teleporting next to you, you should probably stand out there so you don't get like, you know, killed. Uh, cool. Uh, so my second question is that how realistic do you think the avatar should be? Do you have like some examples uh, of avatars? So when we've been experimenting, we started with the ground up. So we were working on masks originally. Um, we experimented with some puppets because we actually realized that um, in terms of the amount of tracking information we had, um, basically the audio levels up to you know, low and high, that we were able to control puppets in a pretty realistic way. We also experimented with some um, South Park Canadian style kind of popping heads, um, and those are pretty interesting. The issue with hyper-realistic is that driving the rig becomes very difficult. The more realistic your face is, the more difficult it is to make it move naturally. You can watch, you can go look at AAA video games right now, and even though their characters look really great, when they're talking, they're, everything, they're still, it starts to fall into the uncanny valley. Um, it's, it's my belief that at some point in time, um, depth camera technology and those things will catch up to the point where we can really just project ourselves into the space, and we won't even need to have avatars that aren't us, but we're not there yet. What's up, man? That hey. Great talk. Thank you. Um, so one of the major points you had was for these shared activities, they kind of have to like have a purpose. So given your experiments, what are some of like, the best purposes that you've found for people to like, go in and have these interactions with each other? I mean, one thing is think of anything that only works in person, right? Like if you think of a category like, man, this only works in person, that's a great place to start. So I know that um, Altspace VR had actually done a D&D &D adventure thing, which is pretty cool because that's something that we think of as only doing in person. And then beyond that, we can actually go to the realm of more fantastic. You know, we've experimented a lot with um, presentations, with uh, collaborating together, with working on white, you know, virtual whiteboards. Um, and we found that to be a strong, strong purpose as well. And um, you know, playing with blocks would be a pretty cool idea too. Hello. Uh, what are you finding is the bare minimum latency to maintain shared presence? And uh, 
what sort of strategies have you found for dealing with high latency? So in terms of latency, do you mean in terms of just general general latency or specifically? Oh, just for the audio, uh, you know, like network latency. If it's 100 milliseconds delayed, is that, does that break the shared presence? Like what is the lower the minimum bound required? So um, we don't have a hard number yet set on that. I mean, you're talking at 100 and lower, you can have pretty natural conversations. Um, the lower you get, the better the experience, obviously, especially depending on the activity and the purpose. If um, you're at a pretty high latency and I throw a ball at you and say catch, um, if you don't hear the catch until the ball's in your face, it's too slow. Cool. Any other questions? I have another one. Okay. So something that was really interesting was kind of like the, having the accurate proportions of a human face for an avatar I thought was cool because some of the social spaces I've gone into people have like I went into the high fidelity alpha and I created an avatar that was a dragon with a daft punk helmet for a head and it was like enormous. It was just like fun, you know, people are going to want to do crazy stuff like that. So how do you like give people creative like options for their avatar but also restrict those to like something that's good for social presence? What I think is that it depends on the context and depends on your objective. Um, I think that there is a sense of presence, a sense of being around other people that is still, you know, they're, it's like you're playing a game with them and, and they're a dragon, they're flying around, you're like, oh, my friend's playing this dragon. But the dragon's never going to land and you're going to think that that's your friend. So in the same way that when you watch a movie, you saw, you know, The Hobbit, you don't immediately think that the you know, smog is Benedict Cumberbatch. You, just, you hear his voice, but clearly it's smog. Like you don't just see his face at accurate proportions strapped onto it. So th that's something we've been thinking a lot about. And knowing that if you want to have people see other people as people, you need to maintain those proportions because we are so hardwired to see the human face. Like I said, we can see it on Mars and we can see it on the moon. If the proportions are right, we'll see a face. So if you take those proportions off, you don't see a face. So. Have you found that eyes in particular are super important? Because then we have some of the avatars uh, in Converge, and like one guy just created an avatar where it's just like it's an axe embedded in a log. I don't know why he really wanted to be like an axe, um, but everyone like just looks at him and they're like they don't know where to look at him. They're like, should I look at the log or like the handle of the axe or like I don't know what's going on here. I get that a lot every day. I mean, should I look at the log, axe. Yeah, so um, it's it's like hard because like he wanted to upload that and like that's something he's really into it's like his twitter icon too but um so it's like he really wants to do that but for us it's like this sucks because like now people don't know where to look at him and like some people are having a bad experience um so yeah it seems like eyes are just really important so as i said you don't even need eyes but having an idea of where those eyes are so even if you don't rep even if you represent them through negative space the idea that what you're seeing is actually not there that's really important. If you're using head tracking, that head is on a head, and that head has eyes. And the thing is that we actually know their IPD, so we even know more specifically exactly what their eyes are. In terms of accurate information, it's some of the most accurate information we have. So if you want to have people interact with each other as other people, if you want to make a log axe game where the logs have come alive through magic, that would totally work. Yeah. And I think that would work within the context. But um, a proper alignment of where the eyes are. Because if you were talking to me right, right now, my eyes were in my chin, like, they would be really weird, and you wouldn't be OK with it. That's true. I yeah. Would. No, you wouldn't. I know, I know you wouldn't. Cool. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much for letting um, me come here and uh, for listening to me. <laughs>